thank you for your patience and tuning in and being patient to wait for me to get through my technical difficulties. I just turned on Facebook prayer, uh, Facebook Live. Uh, I'm not sure, if, uh, Pastor Weston or Pastor Wood, uh, Wood, whether you got praying. Have you have you prayed? No, sir. Could you mind li lifting a word of prayer for us to so break up this airwaves? Yes, sir. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's once again, Lord, that we humbly bow before you, God. Uh, just say thank you, God. We thank you, God, for all your many blessings. And we thank you, God, for last night's rest. We thank you, God, for waking us up this morning with a mind stayed on you, God. Uh, God, we're just so grateful, Lord, that you're God and that you're God right by yourself, Lord. There's none like you. There's none above you, Lord, Father God. And we just uh, lift your name on high, Lord, Father God, on tonight, Lord. There's so much going on in the world, Lord, and I, I just ask God that you allow us uh, to put aside our petty differences, Lord. People yes. hate the word, yes, uh, the unadulterated word, Lord, and we just ask God that you uh, have your way uh, in this Bible study on tonight, Lord, and touch those via Zoom, touch those via Facebook Live, uh, allow us to sit with our tent doors open, Lord, Father God, and allow you to speak to us and not only allow us to be hearers, but be doers of your word. We ask these blessings and all other blessings, Lord. We ask God that you uh, touch Bishop Parks as he brings forth your word, Lord, Father God, uh, on tonight. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. 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 Thank amen. you so much, Pastor Weston. I appreciate that word of prayer. And thank you again for your patience and waiting on me. I, I tried to explain. I had two computers and neither one of them wanted to work, which is unusual. That means that the prince of the air, better known as the devil, Satan, did not want to get this. There's no way I could have two computers. First of all, the computer's new and said the, the drivers and the sound uh, is outdated. That can't be possible. Well, it could be possible. But then my second computer I hadn't turned on in several months. It went through all kinds of stuff. It's all different. But anyway, we're going to talk tonight uh, about the secrets revealed, that that the foundations of the Bible, of the scriptures, are written, for the most part, there's some key on Greek in places, like Dr. Luke, but for the most part is Hebrew or Aramaic. And so in order to understand the logos of the scripture versus the raiment, Tom Parks, good to see you. If you want to read the Bible, locos is fine. But if you want revelation, you have to have rhema. You know, people say, I want a good word, a fresh word. Well, what you really want is a rhema word because the word logos in Greek means given an account, read or spoken. That means you just tell a story. And anybody can read a scripture and tell a story. But rhema, which is a Greek word, means gives divine revelation. And when we come to the Bible, what we ought to be trying to do is get divine revelation, not just read, oh, that was good. Well, you read a novel, and a novel should be good if you bought the right book. But Paul said we must study to show ourselves approved. And the only way you can study is you have to look for the rhema or the revelation in the word. Now, if God is not revealed in the scriptures, you can only know God as a limited God. If, if you can't see God being revealed in the scripture, if you can't see Christ Jesus being revealed in the scripture, all you got is logos. And that in lies our problems is because I read it, my intellect, my opinions, my thoughts. I love uh, Pastor West was preaching, say, when I come to the pulpit, I try to leave my personal opinions out the sermon and, and my personal revelation out the sermon. That was so good because that's good preaching. When you come to the pulpit, your assignment is not to, to be opinionated. Talk about a lot of stuff that for people who come in looking for salvation, but it is to focus on the revelation that God wants people to receive, those who come waiting to receive. So if you don't, if you don't have revelation, Tom Pauls, then the only way you can know God is a limited God. And this is what that means, that you can only know, know him by trouble, right? Crises and bad experience. We get in, we don't even know the God of the Bible like we should 
So we get a Christ season out of life. God delivers us. Now I know a little bit about God. Well, by the time you get in your 60s and 70s, you had so many crises, your, your view of God is different. He's a God that let me have struggles and trouble and problems and, and enemies and all these things. What kind of God is that? That's not the God of the Bible because he, his desire is for us to have peace and not evil. Jeremiah 29, 11, peace, his thoughts, are peace and not evil, but to bring us to an expected end. So, so learning about our Heavenly Father, about our divine creator, through problems, crises, troubles, and bad experience is a hard way to learn. I don't want no part of that. Amen. I don't want no part of me messing up or the devil doing something. God just let me sit there and go through it so I can learn a lesson. What, what, what teacher would want his students to experience trouble? What parent want their child to go through the same thing they went through? So, so here's what the Bible says. Watch this digging this tape. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Let's turn to St. John, the eighth chapter. St. John, the eighth chapter. That's, that's, we got to get this because some people say, you know, if the truth set you free. That's what they say. Uh, well, what does that mean? What am I free from? Am I free from sin? Paul said, oh, no. He said, I die daily. He said, the thing I should do, I don't do. And what I don't do is what I should do. That when I desire to good, eat, do good, evil is always present. Let's look at St. John 8, chapter 31, and the 32nd verse. I want you to get this, Michelle Turner. It says, St. John 8, 31, 32. Then Jesus said to the, those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples. Indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall not set you free, but it will make you free. All right. And some translation may use a different word. The King James says, make you free. So then I need to understand. See, that's logos. I just read that and said, and that now I, I walk away with my opinion. It says, Oh, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Free from what is what I don't understand. So everybody walks away, the 35 people on Zoom and nine people on Facebook walk away with their own interpretation of what the word free mean. So now we've got a problem because now there's 35 denominations that have just been birthed because we don't understand the word free. Sister Lewis, I know Brother, Brother Malcolm got to be somewhere on the screen. Free in Aramaic is the language when you see red. The reason he said, well, the red represents Jesus talking. Now, the red represents he's speaking in an Aramaic language. Free in Aramaic is Shalama, S-H-L-A-M-A. -A. And guess what it means, Tom Paul? It means peace. Oh, my God. That just changed the whole, whole text. He said, verse 32, then it says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall give you peace. Make you have peace. When you know the truth, it makes you have peace. And when you have peace, I guess you could be free, but you could have. Yeah, but but peace is the word. Well, what does peace mean? Peace means free from oppressive thoughts or emotions. See, when you know the truth, everything that you are doubting God about, everything you are doubting what Christ did, why He did it, when He did it, why He does it to certain people, why He does it to everybody, but some people come early, some people come late. When you finally get the truth that makes you free, that makes you have peace, Sister Hooks, then what happens is all these disquieting, oppressive thoughts and emotions, you know, there's so many things going on. And those things are sent by the ministry, the, the spirits that the devil put. He said many spirits have been released in the world. He sends out these spirits to get us all confused. You get confused about, well, everybody's talking about something different. Well, because they're reading it as logos, which makes us be opinionated. But when you get really get into the rhema, what is the word for free and find out it is peace, it changes your whole outlook on life. You shall know the truth because the truth ought to bring, make you peace. That's, that's not like going to the doctor, Tom Paul's, and thinking that something real bad with your body, right? When you go in the doctor's office, he said, well, we ran a scan the last time 
when it came back, uh, we didn't see anything. That don't make you free, but it showed you bring pre peace. That's what we're talking about. When you know the truth of a matter, it brings peace. Now you're calm. So when we study the Bible, we must study seeking rhema. We receive the rhema by examining the context. We already talked about that, right? The context, brother, brother Keith Miller, is the context. Just don't read one scripture. You got to read everything around it. But also we're going to add to that is the language used in the Bible. If I was at New Hope right now, I would say, touch a neighbor and tell him language matters. The language of the Bible matters. What are you looking at? Are you looking at Keon Greek? Are you looking at Hebrew? Are you looking at Aramaic? He said, I don't know nothing about all that. That's why you have to have teachers, right? The teacher is supposed to teach you. And then once we teach you, you make application. Now, the Bible is filled with things revealed. God says the secrets belong to him, but everything revealed belong to us. Let's go to Deuteronomy 29 and 29. God keeps secrets. There's some things God don't want us to know until it's time. But when God reveals something, he reveals it to us. When God wants us to know something, he reveals it to us. Deuteronomy, we're going to Deuteronomy 29th chapter, and we're going to look at the 29th verse. Y'all, please stop me. I want, it, it was so hard to get on here tonight. Please do not let me flow through this Bible study and you not have questions and you need to be asking. All right. So here we go. Deuteronomy 29 and 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Right? Yeah. How did God put all this world together? Man, the sun is sitting there burning, been burning for thousands, some people say millions of years, and never had to have a recharge. Nobody has to fly uh, a spaceship to the sun to pump gas, and it's just sitting there burning. It's just burning. The earth is rotating. The earth is rotating. Right, it nobody has to go up there and balance it. It's it's perfectly balanced. Those things are secrets God keeps. How He did it all. How does grass grow? You got dirt in it. You, you clean your yard off, and then you don't see no more dirt come back a month later. There's grass in there. Where did the grass come from? Why do seasons change? All those things are secret. But look what He said. He said, "But those things which are revealed belong unto us." And to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. God wants us to prosper, so He reveals things to us, so that we and our families, right, can do all the words of the Bible. The eight thousand eight hundred ten promises God wants to release upon us, but He cannot release those promises until there's revelation. I hope y'all still with me. All right. So, so we, yes. Uh, Tan has a question yes. before you move on. Okay, Tan, let me see. I open up. Does, does, the, um, does the revelation come to a preacher, bishop, ETC, or uh, is it revealed to individuals? All right, that is such a great question, Tan. It is revealed most of the time through a preacher. Let me tell you why. Because a preacher should be dedicated to study to show himself approved. But it can be revealed to what? Anybody, if you're willing to then devote the time, the hours that are required to in prayer meditation instead of God's word, God is not good. The Bible says God has no uh, uh, respect of person. He don't have favorites, but he does give the preaching assignment, right? And we're to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to, to do things that, that, that put us in another level of assignment that the ordinary person is not going to do. They're not going to tolerate the suffering. They're not going to tolerate the, the shame. They're not going to tolerate the enemy coming coming after them full force. If he don't like you, he hate us. But the revelation is just said. He said, he didn't say the preachers in here. Let's read it again. He said, but those things which are revealed belong unto us. Right? We are part of the us. Everybody's the us. God wants to reveal it. God will reveal it. His word, his revelation can come through many sources, through many vehicles, through many venues. Right? Preacher could be God, God created music, could be a word in a song. Uh, I drove, I was driving on the interstate and was meditating on a word and 
seeking God, and drove up, and there was a billboard with an ass on it. That, 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 you want to have that experience. That right there was something else. But his, the key is he wants it to be revealed. Now, obviously, the primary source of the revelation comes from the church. That's why he said, forsake not to assemble yourself. Because the preacher, the pastor, whoever's in that pulpit, prim primary job other than administrative leadership, leadership is spiritual leadership to reveal who God is through a preached word, right? How sweet are the feet of those who preach the gospel? How can they hear, right, without a preacher tan? How can they preach except they've been sent? So the preacher is the primary resource, but then teachers are in the church, part of the five, four, four, five, four, four ministry. Teachers should study to show themselves approved, all right? I hope that answers your question that time. So let's keep going here. So we must seek the things that are revealed. Rhema. Rhema in Hebrew is only secret because we have not studied to find out the meaning. We stay with logos. I was talking to a friend of mine, good friend, been known for 30 years. He's here, Parks. Uh, Parks, not Bishop, not John Parks. I don't know why people love to call my last name like I ain't got a first name. Parks, I, man, I, I, I was thought of reading on Friday night and the word was so good. I read the whole weekend. And I changed the subject. Didn't you hear what I said? I said, I heard you. He, I said, you said you read the Bible the whole weekend. What I want to know is, what did you get out of reading the Bible the whole weekend? He said, well, it just, was just good. See what I'm saying? It was just good. Well, unless you got a revelation, then what good was it? You want to be a biblical scholar, you can quote scriptures. But God wants us, he wants to be revealed to us. And therein lies the, the 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 motive of God. Watch this on Ola. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned, and we put a period there, but it says, and come short of the glory of God. God just don't want to bless the leaders. God wants everybody who 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 receives the revelation of who he is, right? to be the glory of God. That's so God can brag on us. So God can say, that's my son. That's my child. So therefore, we must get the revelation of God's word. That's the whole point. All right. And, and, and we're going to learn tonight that the Hebrew text provides the foundation. Because when God got ready to choose a people, he chose Israel. He chose the children. He chose the Hebrew race. He said, they're special to me. He said, they're chosen by me. And every, and told Abraham, every nation going to be blessed out of your seed. All right? Every nation going to be blessed. Because he chose a Hebrew man. And we already talked about the history of Adam, what color Adam was, to be the example for everybody on the planet to follow. The Hebrew race. Because he found a man that was fault, had faults and had problems. But he was obedient. God said, that's the one I want. He's a Hebrew. And everybody coming out of him and every nation that birthed out of him and every nation that see him as an example will be blessed. All right. So to give, give you a, a, a to give you a revelation of a scripture, we're going to get we're going to get this scripture that's quoted, misquoted, misinterpreted, all kind of stuff going on. And we're going to get into it. Tom Parks, we got to get this St. John, the eighth chapter. Let's go back to St. John. For me, a text on Olin is about the, the woman that was caught in adultery. All right, here we go. We go from, we got to get out of this logos and get into Rhema. That's the whole point. And you can't get Rhema until you understand the Hebrew context. Rom, uh, John 8 chapter, here we go. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to read the logos. All right, Tina Dez is going to read the logos. And here's what the logo says. Starting with the third verse. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had sent her in the midst, they say unto him, excuse me, master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded, excuse me, commanded us that such, such should be stoned but what says thou? 
This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, not in the dust, but on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now some, see, if what should pop off your page is, why is he writing on the ground? Okay, let's keep reading. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted himself, lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. All right. Now, when you look at the logos, your mind start going into going to places. You start saying, Well, you know, Mosaic law, Leviticus 20 and 10 says, if a man and a woman get caught in adultery, man with another man's wife, the man and the woman supposed to be killed, murdered, right? Taken out and killed. So that means, oh, then you get, here, here we go, Tom Paul. Well, where was the man? Where, where, that's low. If, if, if she was in adultery, Logos, I read it. There ain't no man in the text. So my mind, my opinion started going into, where's the man? Why they ain't bring the man? Oh, it's a setup. That's what's wrong with the world now. They put women down. All this stuff that is not in the text. It is not nowhere in there. Jesus talking about the world putting women down and all that stuff. Because he said to the woman, if, if you ain't got nobody to accuse you, I don't condemn you either. That's, that's, that's a cue. That's a cue. He said, if there ain't nobody here to accuse you, then, uh, I'm not, a, I'm not condemning you, all right? So we miss the revelation because we look at the logos, read the text, and there we go, start interpreting what it means and don't know what the words mean. Rhema, why did he write on the ground? Not once, but twice. He, the point of the text is not ain't no man with the woman. The point of the text ain't. The, the, the woman coming without being accused without a man. The point of the text has nothing to do with they heard him talking. The point of the text is they saw him writing on the ground. Now, in order to understand this, why he wrote on the ground, you got to understand the Hebrew law in the Hebrew text. And you have to understand and you have to search the scriptures to find the revelation. So let's go to Jeremiah's 17th chapter. Jeremiah 17, get the revelation. He's telling us, I don't condemn you. They walked away condemned. So it can't be about this women's thing and where's the man? That's what's wrong with the world because the women gonna get a hard time. Men oppress them. And even though the Jews oppressed everybody, they didn't, the, them Pharisees didn't care about nobody. They oppressed everybody. Jeremiah the 17th chapter. Let's Let's look at Jeremiah 17 because it points out the Jewish context. Jew Jeremiah 17 chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. Y'all got it? Jeremiah 17. Good to see you, Kim Blackwell. The 13th verse. Here's what he says. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be ridden there we go, in the earth or in the ground because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. So there it is that there's a law of God that says when anybody forsake him or anybody, right, uh, uh, say forsake him or his word, then God writes their name in the ground. He said, write their name in the ground. Okay, what does that mean, Bishop Paul? When you write something in the ground, it's not permanent. It's temporary. When rain comes, wash it away. Winds come, wash it away. So, so it had nothing to do with them saying, hearing him say, uh, 
if any be without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. It had to do with Jeremiah 17 and 13, which says, if I write your name on the ground, it signifies that you have forsaken the law of God and you've forsaken the Lord. Why did they leave Jesus and the woman? Because when Jesus wrote in the ground, they knew they had forsaken the law of God, the word of God. Because the word of God said, bring both of them, but they brought one. And number two, they had forsaken the Lord. Why? Because they were trying to condemn an innocent man. So let me give you the revelation of St. John 8th chapter. St. John 8th chapter and the 33rd through the ninth verse. Here we go. Here we go, Deaconess Evans. The translation, whosoever does not keep the word of God and has forsaken the Lord cannot accuse anyone. That's what he's talking about. That's the revelation, not the story, not where is the man, not Jesus said, if anybody got a stone, cast the first stone. The revelation is if you don't, if you yourself are not keeping the word of God, he said, he said, he said, he said uh, what's saying? He said, if you, if you don't, the Ten Commandments, if you don't do one, you're guilty of what? All of them. <laughs> That's what he said. Well, you know, I'm still working on that one. Uh, I'm still working on that. One. I, I, I got, well, I got three of them in the belt, but I'm working on the, the remaining seven. He said, if you don't keep the word of God and you have forsaken the Lord, you cannot accuse anyone. That's the rhema out of the text. What I need to walk away is, if I, there's some things I'm not doing according to God's word, mm hmm. And I have some things I know I should do, and I'm not doing it for the Lord. That means I've forsaken him. I have no rights to accuse anyone. Jeremiah 17, 13. You see the power of the Hebrew context? You see the power of revelation? Because I would have took that thing, tell me, oh, you preach 10 ser different sermons about John, the woman in the dojo, and none of them be right. Because we, we are using logos, and as Pastor Weston so graciously pointed out in his sermon. Now we're coming with our opinions. And everybody got an opinion. Somebody gonna focus on a woman. Somebody gonna focus on a man. Somebody gonna somebody gonna focus on this. Somebody gonna focus on that. But the real world relations found in Jeremiah 17 and 13. All right? Okay. Y'all ready to move on? I think Tan, we got we hear your baby in the background. There you go. Thank you. You must search the scriptures for the Hebrew or Aramaic context to receive Rhema, to receive the revelation. Some, they say that Greek wrote the Bible in Greek. They wrote a Bible in Greek, but the revelation could only come from the people whom God had chosen, the Hebrew race. That's Deuteronomy 7 and 6. I'm not going to read that scripture, but I quoted it. God chose them. He said, you special to me, and, and, and you shall, and, and shall teach the inhabitants of the land. All right? Now, the truth is that they wrote about, but for the most part, the people that wrote about spoke here in Hebrews Aramaic. Hebrews and Aramaic languages were transliterated. The Bible is a Hebrew, Greek, uh, Hebrew for the most part, Hebrew and Aramaic text that the Greeks transliterated. The word transliterated means write, a, write or print a letter word using the closest corresponding letters of a different alphabet. In other words, they didn't have letters that the, the Hebrew language don't have 20, what is it, 26 alphabets. They don't have that. They don't have the letter H. Greek don't have, so, but the Greeks said we can't use their letters because we don't understand them. So they transliterated the text and put it from a Greek context and change words. And when you change a word, you change the meaning, you change the revelation. Now we sit here reading what we think Greek and King James tried to clean it up, but Constantine had an you know, impact on him. And, but it's still transliterated. So this is most important because it reflects the scripture's inner essence and mutual, you got to know the moral values of the original language. The Hebrew language is called Lashon HaKadosh. That means Hebrew language and for the Jews. So here's further evidence. Watch this. I'm going to give you logos and then I'm going to give you a ring. Turn to Acts. I'm trying to make up some, some time. But you stop me if you if you uh, need to ask a question. The book of Acts, the ninth chapter. I want you to get this. I want you to get this, Kim. Book Acts, the ninth chapter, the third through the sixth verse. This logo is time pause. I want you to get this. Let me read it. 
And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told there what thou must do. Now, most pastors read that in Logos. He immediately start talking about the Greek word. The Greek word for this is, the Greek word for this is, and the Greek word for that is. Pastor, wasn't there? We'd be using Greek to try to explain uh, Acts 9, 4, uh, 3 through 6, only because they think, they think the Greek wrote the original text. But let, so that's Logos. But I want to find out, I know it was Christ talking to him. And I know Christ didn't speak Greek. He spoke Northern Aramaic, what King James called it Hebrew. He didn't put the Aramaic, he said Hebrew. So let's, let's get to Revelation. Did Jesus speak in Greek to Paul? You just read it, right? Paul said, I was on the Damascus Road. I heard, I saw a light. I heard a voice talking to me. And the voice said, it's hard to get kick against the prick, go into Damascus, etc. You heard, you read it, Tom Paul, did you not read that? You just read it, right? And you would say, well, that's Greek. But let's find out the revelation. What was Je language was Jesus speaking in? Let's go to the book of Acts. Everybody run over to the book of Acts. We're getting ready to go somewhere tonight. I didn't mean, I didn't come to shake up your world, but I come to shake you up so that you can start Want to receive. Ooh, that was a good word. It was only good if you got a revelation. Maybe <laughs> it was good because the preacher was hooping and hollering at the end. You know, that ain't that ain't that ain't, if you come to church for that, uh, you 50 years later, you'll still be the same. All right, the book of Acts, the 26th chapter. Few verses, but I want you to I, this is gonna be um this is one of them earth-shattering moments. Because I just read the text from which Dr. Luke was writing. But now I'm reading the text from Paul talking himself. Y'all got Acts 26. The name verse says this. Verily I thought within myself that, that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints did I shut up in prison. First of all, he didn't say Christians. He said what? Saints. Sister Sharon Lewis, we learned last week that we were called to be saints. Guess what he just called? He said, I, I, I dealt with the saints. He said, I dealt with the Christian. Let's keep reading. I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them off. I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being seemingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto the strange cities. That means he went into places outside of where the Jews reside. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me in them which journeyed with me. And when we were all falling to the ground, here we go, Tom, watch it, underline the Bible. I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying, in the Hebrew tongue. Y'all see it? He said Jesus was speaking. Y'all got yourself muted and quiet. It said Jesus wasn't speaking Greek. He sure wasn't speaking English. Paul said, look at it. He said, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for me to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. <coughs> so when, when, when you say that Jesus was speaking in Greek or the Greek said this, even the Greek had enough sense to say, we can't translate that other than one way. King James said, Jesus speaking in Northern Aramaic. Remember, no, Aramaic means that King James was Hebrew. There was Southern Aramaic, but where Jesus lived was in the North. And so the, it's like the North, we say, y'all talk funny. And then they come down here and say, we talk funny too, because we in the South, right? 
Jesus was nor north uh, of Syria. So therefore he spoke in northern Aramaic. And when King James saw that, he said, that's Hebrew. Technically it is, but it's not. It's slight variation. So you see, Jesus spoke in what, Tom Paul? Hebrew. How do I know? Because he just said it. Now, if I read Acts the book, Acts the ninth chapter, and just ran on off without studying the Bible, listen to this, Aunt Ola, ran on off, stopped at reading one weekend, as my friend said, and got good to me, read Friday, Saturday, and Sunday evening, then and then read to the 26th verse, you'd run around talking, and Jesus said, and the Greek said, but if I had to stumble over to Acts 26, I would have found out them words that Jesus was telling Paul, he was talking in what? Hebrew. All right. Now, some of y'all still stuck there, but I got to move on. You still saying, Bitch Paul, why didn't I know that before tonight? Because you read the book of Acts, but you stumbled over the 26th chapter of Acts and found that Jesus was speaking Hebrew. All right. Paul spoke Aramaic and Greek. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians, the 16th. Wait, oh, wait a minute. I'm so sorry. I'm going so fast. All right, now. Some biblical scholars suggest at the time of Paul, the Jews only spoke Kion Greek. However, the Bible contradicts these claims. When Paul was in Jerusalem, he spoke Hebrew. We're in the book of Acts, ain't we? Go back to the 21st chapter. 21st chapter. It's up. My God, it's been in the hill of Paul. It's been here all the time. It, 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 ain't, it just didn't show up. It ain't just in my Bible. I didn't buy a special Bible. I didn't order one from heaven and he delivered it to my front door using the Amazon truck. This been in here. Then this is why we must study. Let's go to Acts 20, 21 and 40. I would read all it. Matter of fact, let's start at the 37th verse. I'm going to change my notes. Let's start at the 37th verse. And I'm going to read to the 40th verse. Y'all got Acts 17? I mean, Acts 21 and 40. Here we go. We're going to start with the 37th verse. Here's what he says. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he's in Jerusalem. He said unto the chief priest, may I speak unto thee? Who said, watch this. The person he was talking to said, can you speak Greek? That's what they asked Paul, right? Verse 38. Art thou that Egyptian, which before these days made an uproar and and led it out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers. But Paul said, I'm a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a city of, of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hands unto the people. And where there was made a great silence, he spoke unto them in the Hebrew tongue. It, it's right there. He was speaking Hebrew, actually Aramaic, but King James called it Hebrew. You got that, Tom Paul? Well, let's look at chapter 22, which is right beneath chapter 21. He says, men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make known unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he said, uh, when they heard that Paul, the name was, they were Jews, right? And the guy said, well, we got, we, 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 we Romans spoke key on Greek, right? In Latin. He said, but when the Jews heard him speak in Greek, he spoke in the Hebrew language. It said they got real quiet. Everybody. And listen to what Paul had to say. Mm -mm. It's getting heavy around here. It's getting heavy. It's getting heavy. You got to understand the scripture Bible from the Hebrew context, not English. And definitely not logos. Read the story and then you start talking on your opinions about what I think. And y'all sitting around at the coffee table down at Bojangles eating a Bojangles biscuit. <laughs> And a cup of coffee talking about, well, you know what? I, the way I see it is, it's, there is no way you see it. There is the word of God written in text and context, mm -hmm. but he intends for us to, to see it in Rhema, which is to receive a revelation. Revelation is Paul spoke Hebrew. 
Revelation is when Jesus spoke to Paul on Damascus Road, he spoke to Paul in Hebrew because there's a different meaning in Hebrew. Paul got it because Jesus, by speaking Hebrew, tied the Old Testament to the New Testament. Because that's what Paul, Paul grew up learning. He, he was a Hebrew. He was a Jew. He learned the Old Testament. So Jesus related to him in the language that tied the Old Testament to him, who primarily, you know, the dispensation of grace, spoke in the New Testament. All right? Paul spoke Aramaic and Greek in 1 Corinthians 16 and 12. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 16 and 22. Because the reason I'm teaching on this because I had to have a, I got invited to, <laughs> I got invited to speak on one thing. I think it was Pastor West and Pastor Wood. I think it was a setup. I talked for about 10 minutes and then them brothers going to say, well, but Bishop Paul, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to disturb your presentation, but we observed, you know, they talk, certainly we observed that you use a lot of Hebrew and these brothers up in here, most of us have graduated from seminary. I said, I never graduated from no seminary. He said, well, of course you haven't. That's, that's the, minimize me, right? And said, but you always use, but see, we understand the Bible from the Greek perspective. And all I did was, I don't, thank God it's something that I had already this prepared. I said, well, you know what? Let's set this presentation aside and let's go in here and do some Bible study. And what you're hearing tonight is what they heard. And they were just like the men that brought the woman in adult. The time they had a break, they were putting the thing up in there trying to get up out of there. And I, I started calling them. No, don't leave now. I'm not finished. Come back and have a seat. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 16 and 22. There we go. Paul speaking Greek and uh, uh, Aramaic. Y'all got 1 uh, Corinthians 16. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, Maranatha. Hey, did you have you seen that verse? I'm sure you did. As you was reading through the Bible. Did you ever think what, what is he talking about? That ain't that ain't English. Why did they put that in the Bible as anathema anathema and maranatha? Because it is two words put together. It is the Greek word anathema which means ban, removed, and expel. And the word Maranatha is Aramaic. It means the Lord will come, right? So Paul put Greek and Hebrew together, but that's a Hebrew word, Maranatha. And Anathema is a Greek word that means ban, and Maranatha means the Lord will come. So let's read it in the context. If any man love not the Lord, Jesus Christ, let him be expelled. That's what it says. If any man does not love the Lord God, Jesus Christ, let him be expand, expel, remove, ban. Maranatha means the Lord will come. So all he take, let me translate this scripture. 1 Corinthians 16 and 22. Withdraw or separate from all who love not the Lord Jesus Christ, for that same Lord Jesus Christ is coming. So you can't... You can't not love Christ. First of all, he said, expel them if they say, I ain't, ain't nothing to Jesus. I don't agree with that. Well, you can't be a part of this church because <laughs> this church right here believe in Jesus Christ. He said, expel them. You can't put me out. Oh, yes, we can. Same way we brought you in. You didn't walk in there to some member. We brought you in and said, congregation, are you willing to accept? Amen. Same group that said amen could be this group to say, put them out. He said, if you don't accept the Lord Christ, we don't, we don't teach Muslim. We don't teach Buddha. We don't teach Hare Krishna. We don't teach none of that. It's Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus depends on what side of the cross. So translators withdraw or separate from all who love not the Lord Jesus Christ, for that same Lord Jesus Christ is coming. You set up in the church and you don't love Christ, you got a, a rude awakening because Jesus is coming. So if you don't love him, you just miss the boat because when he comes, he's coming to capture all of us who, who are not dead to be to bring paradise back to the planet. That is Hebrew Greek. Those two words that you read, right? So it's important to understand what the words mean in the context, Greek and Hebrew. All right. Here's the last one, and this right here, I know it's going to take some people some places. Let's turn to St. Matthew's, the twenty-seventh chapter. 
St. Matthew's, the 27th chapter. And we're going to lift up the 46th verse. Pastor Weston, I was talking. You probably remember this, Pastor Weston. He said, you know, people talk about the translation of the Bible, like they got different translations. They got it wrong. And he said something profound. I don't know whether you remember or not. He said, I don't, I don't think the Bible got it wrong. I think the scribes must have misprinted some words. Remember that, Pastor Weston? He said, I, I believe that the Bible is infallible. That means it is truth. It means it cannot be denied. But when you don't have a Xerox copy machine, you don't have a, a laptop and a printer. You know how they all, you know how they wrote, how they wrote the copies of the Bible before they created a print press? They had a scribe sitting there writing every word. <laughs> right? And they're supposed to have somebody to check it or proofread it. But you know, when you proofread something, you still can miss a word. So in their efforts to write these Bibles so that everybody could have a copy, they had to handwrite it. And the scribes who handwrite had to not miss a word. And because the Greeks were translating Hebrew text, they were always dealing with the alphabet. And one little word, one letter could throw the word off. And that's what we're going to find here. St. Matthew's 27th chapter in the 46th verse. Here's this text. This text. Y'all got St. Matthew's 27 and 46? Got about 10 minutes. All right, here we go. And above about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatini. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, we're going to find out tonight that just one letter in this text will make you mistranslate what Jesus was saying. All right? Here we go. Eli, Eli translated in Greek. So the Greek looked at it and said, we don't have an alphabet for these, but we're going to come close to it. Me, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, right? That's what he says. He said, he said this is to say, my God, my God, Eli, Eli. Okay. Sabatana translated in Greek is, you have left me. So this last thing of Christ was translated in Greek means, my God, my God, you've left me. All right. Now, if St. Matthew 27, 46 meant, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Romans would have mocked him and the Jews would have said he was a sinner. They were already mocking him. Let's go to St. Matthew, say the same chapter, 27th chapter. Let's go up to the 39th verse. And they had passed by, reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou destroyed the temple, temple, and build it up it in three days. Save yourself, if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocked him with the scribes, and elders said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross. And we will believe him. And he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in the, his teeth. In other words, they were already making fun of him. Hey, if you Christ, come down. If you Christ, come down. You said she's going to be build this temple in three days. If, if somebody, if you die three days later, you'd be getting up. So if that's who you say you are, come down off the cross. So now let's look at this. They're already mocking him. They're already laughing at him. He's been beaten. He's disfigured. His face is torn up. You don't even recognize him. Why would he say, my God, why has you forsaken me? You know why? Because the Greek missed one letter in the word and changed the whole context. So let's go farther. Here we go. The full context, you got to read from verse 46 to verse number 50 to see whether verse number 46 makes sense. Verse 46, Pastor Wood says, and in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatini, that is to say, my God, my God, why thou hast forsaken me. You know how that word has got them wrong, how, I, how the Lord gave me that there was a misspelled word in there? Like Pastor Weston said, the meaning is the same, it's the right, but the word is one word wrong. 
is because verse, look at verse 47. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man called it for Elias. Wait a minute. If you said, my God, my God, how did they get the Jews sitting there saying he's calling for Elijah? <laughs> so he can't, he couldn't have been saying, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? Because it said the Jews, let's go to Paul, verse 47 said, some of them, he's crying out, the Greeks say, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, which means, my God, my God, why is that forsaken me? Then the, when they heard his voice say that, verse 47 said, some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man called for Elijah. Not for God. He's calling for Elijah. So he, he, somebody, somebody got it wrong. Verse number 48. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it in a reed and gave him a drink. So if he was saying, my God, why are you forsaking me? I'm not asking for vinegar. I'm asking for God. So we know that can't be right. Verse number 49. The rest said, let be, let us, let us see whether Elijah would come to save him. And Jesus, here we go. When he had cried again with a loud voice, he said it twice, yield up the ghost. So clearly when you look at the text, you say, oh, he's calling on God. But when you read the context, Tom Parks, the verses before and the verses after. They laughing at him. They're mocking him. They, they're saying, you promised to do things. If you're the son of God, come down off the cross. Everybody want to see come down off the cross. And then the Greek would make us think he's saying, God, why are you, why you forsaking me? And then they heard him say that. And then they would say, oh, he's calling on Elijah. Because Eli, Eli in Hebrew means Elijah. So therefore, the Greeks miss a letter. Let's keep going. Let's find out what happened. The tone of the words does not indicate an appeal to God to help him. That's implied by expositors, Bible scholars, some of them, not everybody. You can research it. The Jews thought he was calling on Elijah. For Elijah, Eli is a rap Aramaic word for Elijah. The prophets had foretold that Elijah was coming before the Messiah would come. This is not the case on the cross. There's no, Elijah ain't coming because Jesus is dying. They thought Jesus was calling on Elias. Verse number 47. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man called it for Elias. Pastor Wood, that's an indication that somebody missed the letter or the translator missed the translation. But we got to get the revelation, all right? One thought that he was thirsty and gave him bitter to drink. Verse 48, right? Verse 49, the rest was looking to see was Elias coming to save Jesus. When Jesus cried again, he cried, he said it two times on Ola. He gave up the ghost and died. He, he was saying to God, speed up my death. That's what he was saying. He wasn't saying, why have you forsaken me? He was saying, twice, first time, I'm ready to die. Because he came to do what? To die. Bishop Paul, you don't lost it. You don't flip. You don't flip. You don't messed up. We were, we were, we was, we was excited about Bible study until you got off track. And I don't know where you went. You went out of, went to Atlanta. I don't know what you did when you went to Atlanta, but you coming back up in here talking some crazy stuff. Cause I ain't never heard this. Because we're not, we don't study the context for what? For revelation. Here we go. Here we go. The Greek word, the Greek words in translation that's given are Eli, Eli, Lama. Wait a minute, excuse me, let's go back. The original, the original Aramaic words are Eli, Eli, Amana, Amana, I-M-A-N-A, not L-A-M-A. Somebody got, somebody got a letter missing. It's not L-A-M-A, it's L-A-L-M-A-N-A. -A -A. Here we go. The original word Eli, Eli, Lamana, Sabatana means, my God, this is my destiny to die. This, oh my God, I wish I, I wish we was in church so we could really get with it. It means, Tom, that Jesus wasn't saying, God, why he was forsaking me. Because they're all laughing at him. He said, it's my destiny to die. 
He said, it's my destiny to die. And he what? Died. Let me, let's go deeper, Bishop Paul. Put your scuba gear on. The Greek word and translation are given Eli, Eli, Elijah, Elijah. There's no word like lama in Aramaic. It should be L-M-A-N-A. -A. Somebody got a wrong letter. Sabachana. There's no word like Sabachana in Aramaic. It should, should be Shabbat, B-A-K, not B-A-C. He said, what's wrong with a letter? One letter in your name could change your name, Tom Paul's, from Tom to talk, to talk, tick, talk. T-O-M, if I drop the M and put a K, I'd be, hey, talk. He said, my name ain't talk. I changed one letter. I didn't change it. The name, but I changed one letter. So, so here's what we're saying. There's no Lama in the Aramaic. There's no Sabbat. It's Sabbat Tanah. It is Sabbat, Shabbat Tanah in Aramaic. So, so therefore, Jesus is really saying, my God, my God, this is my destiny to die. Well, they were all laughing. They were all laughing at him. He was he was speaking in Aramaic. They got it wrong. They was listening in Greek. And guess what they did? They said, Eli, oh, he's calling on Elijah. Oh, he wants to get a glass of water. They gave him vinegar. And the rest of them said, oh, when is we're going to sit right here and see what Elijah come. So this, so the 46th verse, Tom Paul could not be him saying, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Because everybody talking around that text ain't even talking about God. They're talking about give him something to drink and Elijah's coming before we, the Messiah comes. So this guy got to be a fake. And oh, by the way, we're going to stand right here and wait to see is Elijah going to come and get him off the cross. Now, some biblical scholars suggest that Psalms 22 and 1 proves that that's what it means. Because Psalm 22 and 1 says, my God, my God, what the forsaken me. But that song was not written as a shout out for God, Christ. It was David talking. <coughs> David's in trouble. He done lost his kingdom. He running. He said, God, you set me up as king. You made me a victor, a, gave me victory. And now I'm out here living in the woods. <laughs> so why have you, why did you lift me up and then let me down? That was David. That, that is not a quote. Tied to St. Matthew 27, 46. Just read it. Read the whole Psalms 27. You can see it ain't nothing about Christ. It's about David when David was going through. So if it was about the phrase, Eli, Eli, Lama, it should be Asabetana, not Sabatana, if it was Psalm 22, one had been written. So the correct translation, and this is not me talking. Yeah, I've confirmed here. I don't never get on in public, and intent to try to mislead people. This can be backed up and confirmed. The correct translation of St. Matthew 27, 46 is simple. My God, my God, this is my destiny to die. Then he said it twice, and when God heard him, he died. It's my destiny to die. That's what he was saying. Not, why have you forsaken me? And then well, we, we preachers like to here we go. Where in his humanity, he was on the cross as his, he was always God. <laughs> he was always God. You know, well, you won't, you won't talk to yourself. My God, it's, this is my time to die. And he died when he said it the second time because he had finished the assignment that God thought God gave him. So you can't have the complete revelation. Can y'all give me about two minutes of God's word without understanding the Hebrew essence and moral laws? Being black, listen to this, Brother Malcolm Lewis. Being black does not mean we can go to Africa and understand or receive the revelation from their language. He said, I'm black. They black. I'm going to go over there. They start speaking in African. He said, well, I'm, we all black. So what they really saying is, no, you have to live in Africa, grow up in Africa, know the moral laws of Af Africa, to un and speak African language to be able to understand what the Africans are saying. So likewise, we can't use English to look at the Bible and think we're going to get a revelation. And we sure enough can't look at the Greek because in most part, there's some Greek in here, but for the most part, it's Hebrew and Aramaic because the Greek didn't even have the letters. There's no J in, in uh, uh, Aramaic. It ain't Jehovah, it's Yahovah. It ain't Jesus, it's Yahshua. And when we sing, we say hallelujah. 
not is with a J, but because the Greek changed it to J, because they say, well, we don't have, we don't use Y's like that. So in conclusion, I read this, I read this scripture 30 years ago. And I've been, I was on a hunt for 25 years trying to find this scripture. What was the meaning of this scripture? I'm going to close this out and why this was so necessary tonight. 25 years ago, I ran across the scripture and I've studied and studied. I've consulted. And here's the scripture, Revelation 12 and 9. Why we had to teach this tonight. Because when we get the text mixed up and messed up, we're not free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you have peace. Revelation, y'all hanging there with me, chapter 12, verse 9. Here's the scripture that I stumbled onto as a young man, younger man. It says, verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out in the earth, and his angel was cast out with him. That plagued me. It said that the, now this wasn't written in 2024. It was written close to 20, you know, almost 2000 years ago, maybe 1900 plus years. It said that the devil has deceived the world. He's deceiving the world. So I, I, I was, how could he do that? Well, halfway on my 30 year journey, I discovered that religion was not created by God. God didn't create Baptist, Methodist, <laughs> Pentecostal, Church of God in Christ, Assembly of God in Christ, Primitive back to free will Baptist. God had nothing to do with none of that. So the devil created religion. So we all be confused about which, which God are you looking at and how to baptize and what day to worship, all this stuff creates, as Pastor Weston said on the intro, just people just petty little arguments and getting families falling out because, well, you worship on the Sunday, it's supposed to be on the Saturday. He's supposed to baptize in Jesus now, baptize in the name of, that's the devil. He created religion to confuse us. That's the first revelation I got halfway through the 30 years. And the second revelation I got was the difference between logos and rhema. And recently learning that the Bible for the most part is Hebrew and Aramaic. And so when you read it that way, you see the truth or it brings peace. So in order, in order to understand what John is saying, you got to come down here and read verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. John wrote this, Sister Gail Croce, on the island of Patmos, because John was letting us know that the devil has war against us. It's a war. This ain't no looking at the person in the pew that didn't speak to you. This is the devil behind everything, trying to accuse the brethren, trying to create confusion, making us look at it in the English context, making us read the logos and coming with our own opinion. All of that is so that we cannot see the revelation of who God is and don't even know that we're living by mercy and grace because he reigns on everybody. That's grace and mercy. He, he, he's good to everybody, for he is good to everybody. Yeah, because he's God. He's love. God ain't trying to love us. God is love. So we right there with them. So we think, well, you know, and then we say to them, come on over here and join me. And they say, why? why? Why would I leave the club and join your club called the church? Y'all up in there mad at each other, jealous and backbiting, gossiping. Well, we down here drinking our Jack and Coke. We happy. We just dance and we get through. Our clothes is full of smoke. But when we leave, we leave feeling good. Y'all leave. Y'all be grumpy, mean, because they see us at the house mean, right? We're going to preach a sermon about Sunday God has you on display. And we're going to talk about why people don't come follow us when they should. That's another subject. So therefore, you got to get rhema. You got to get rhema. The rhema. way to get rhema is to understand the context. And when I understand the context, I got to read scriptures above and beneath around that. And then when I read the scripture, but then I got to look at the text from a Hebrew perspective. And then all of a sudden the words pop off the page and you just want, you have peace in what you thought your relation with God that you thought was bad. You will find out it ain't as bad as you thought. You think your relation is bad because people read the logos, make their opinion, then judge you. And Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn nobody. 
That means you can't condemn nobody unless you're keeping all of the word of God. If you're keeping it, if there's anybody on this line tonight that can keep the word of God and do everything that the Ten Commandments, forget about the Bible, Ten Commandments say, then you're good. But God says that's not true. And God says that there's a, there's a problem that's coming your way. Wow, I can't believe it. Tom Paul, we made it. Well, it went over four minutes. I was trying to get through it. I didn't allow y'all time to have a lot of questions. I ain't got a question. I'm going to send these notes out. I want you to study these notes. And then on next Tuesday, we're going to spend some time. Y'all going to have to unmute your mic. And you have to talk back to me so we can make sure we get this. I didn't make this up. This is all in. This is all affirmed and confirmed. But while it's new to us, Facebook, got a pastor all the way over in Pakistan connecting with us. We're in Winston-Salem. Got a church over there trying to get the word of God into Pakistan. And guess what? Michelle Turner, for some reason, he came across New Hope. He's on here right now. Pastor Sabir Gill came across New Hope's service. I mean, Bible study and heard us teach and said, I got to get with this pastor. And guess what? We send him the word of God through email. And he's over there teaching. And people, people are joining that church because they had no idea of what Jesus Christ was. They had an idea, but they're getting an in-depth understanding of what Jesus Christ is all about. All right? I see Rhonda Caldwell on here tonight. Took time from your master's degree. I heard about you. Hope all is well. You're making all A's, writing all those papers and stuff. Thank you all so much for coming. I really thank God for you being patient. We lost almost 30 minutes, but you held in there. You didn't have to do it. But I hope tonight brought a revelation to you. Pastor Woods? I... I'm here. All right. All right, would you close us in prayer? Pastor Woods, unmute yourself. You said you hear you, then you got muted back. What happened? Okay, then you disappeared. I don't know. Kathy, oh, there you are. I hear you, I hear you now. Let's say the Father, we thank you for this day. Yeah, we got some going on, Pastor Wood. It's messing up. Let, let me, let Pastor Weston pray. Pastor Weston, are you available to pray? If not, I'll just pray. I know he's got, he's not on, I don't see his face and I don't see his name, but I'm sure he's on here. Let me just pray. Right. Father God, we, Father, Heavenly Father, we come to thank you for this Bible study. We thank you for all those who have attended. We thank you for this word that has been released. And we pray that it's been pleasing in your sight that we may receive a greater revelation of who you are, your plan and your purpose for our life. We learn who you are and your purposes and your plan, not by experience, but by your word. So let this word be, be the anchor of our soul. Bless the hearers, not only be hearers, but be doers also. We thank you. We love you. We praise you because you're worthy of all of the honor, glory, and praise. We pray this prayer by the power and authority given to us by Christ Jesus. And we say amen, amen, amen. and amen. May, amen. The grace, may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest rule in the Bible with these people henceforth and forever. Amen. God, God bless all of you tonight. God bless you.